volunteers will go ahead and make a start with this event. So welcome everyone to the fifth online roundtable in our Shelley 200 series, which is leading ever closer to the bicentenary of Shelley's death and to the Shelley Conference, which will take place at Keats House, London from eight to nine July this summer. Our event this evening is on Shelley and travel. And we're considering travel in a broad sense from Shelley's actual to imagined travels to epistolary descriptions of travel to traveling fragments and more. Travel and motion propel Shelley's poetry and life. Arriving in Calais en route to Italy in 1818, Shelley writes of being in excellent spirits. Motion has always this effect upon the blood, even when the mind knows that there are causes for dejection. Later from Milan, Shelley often revisits Marlowe in thought. You inhabit a spot which before you inhabit it is as indifferent to you as any other spot upon the earth. And when persuaded by some necessity, you think to leave it, you leave it not. Each of our speakers will deliver a short presentation on a particular aspect of Shelley and travel. And this will be followed by a round table discussion and an open Q and A. So I'm Amanda Blake Davis. I'm an organizer of the Shelley Conference and our Shelley 200 series of events, along with the lead organizer, Anna Mercer, Bish Coffey and Paul Stevens. We would like to thank our advisory board, Will Bowers, Madeline Callahan, Kelvin Everest and Sharon Rustin, and our postgraduate helpers, Laura Blunsden and Anna Romanelli for all of their support in shaping the conference and events. And I would especially like to thank our speakers this evening, Nahoko Miyamoto Alvi, Benjamin Colbert, Kian Duffy and Anna Mercer, who I'll introduce to you following a few bits of Zoom housekeeping. So we ask the audience to please keep your cameras off and microphones muted during this event in order to limit disruptions. Everyone is very much encouraged to use the chat box throughout the event. And during the Q&A and at the end of the event, you'll have the opportunity to unmute yourself and appear on screen if you wish to. You may type questions into the chat box at any point during this event and we'll pick them up in the Q&A at the end. Or you may use the raise hand function during the Q&A at the end. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please type into the chat box or contact myself or Paul directly. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and our conference website, theshelleyconference.com. Please do visit our website to watch past roundtables and video interviews with our advisory board and for information on the Shelley Conference. Registration for the Shelley Conference is currently open to presenting delegates, but will soon open to the public. Please contact us through the contact form on our website if you wish to be notified once registration has opened. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Nahoko Miyamoto Alvi is professor in the Department of Area Studies at the University of Tokyo, Komaba campus. She is the author of Strange Truths in Undiscovered Lands, Shelley's Poetic Developments and Romantic Geography with the University of Toronto Press in 2009 and republished in 2020. She is the editor and translator of the selected Poetry of Shelley bilingual edition with Iwanami in 2013. She is currently working on a book manuscript on Poetics of Romantic Strangership to be published by the University of Tokyo Press. Benjamin Colbert is reader in English literature at the University of Wolverhampton and co-editor of European Romantic Review. He is the author of Shelley's Eye, Travel, Writing and Aesthetic Vision with Ashgate in 2005. And he contributed the chapter on Shelley, travel and tourism to the Oxford Handbook of Percy Bysshe Shelley in 2013. His scholarly editions include Lady Morgan's France and Francis Trollope's Paris and the Parisians both in the Chawton House Library series, Women's Writing in Post-Napoleonic France in 2012. His edited collections include, most recently, Continental Tourism, Travel Writing, and the Consumption of Culture, 1814 to 1900, with Palgrave this year with Lucy Morrison. An ongoing project is his groundbreaking British Academy-funded biobibliographical database Women's Travel Writing, 1780 to 1840, which we will link to in the chat later. He's currently mm -hmm. collaborating with the Chawton Library on an exhibition entitled Trailblazers, Early Women Travel Writers and the Exchange of Knowledge, 
from the 12th September to 26th February next year, September this year is February next year, which draws on research from the database. Kian Duffy is Professor and Chair of English Literature at Lund University, Sweden. He has published on various aspects of the intellectual life and cultural history of Britain and Europe during the Romantic period. Particular focal points have been the work of the Shelley Circle, the Sublime, and Romanticisms in the Nordic Countries. He is the author of Shelley and the Revolutionary Sublime with Cambridge in 2005. His latest monograph, British Romanticism and Denmark, is forthcoming with Edinburgh University Press in July, and a collection of essays, Nordic Romanticisms, Translation, Transmission, Transformation, will be published by Palgrave later this year. He is currently editing the Cambridge Companion to the Romantic Sublime, due in 2023. Anna Mercer is lecturer in English literature at Cardiff University. She specializes in Romanticism, especially the Shelleys, and has research interests in literary relationships, women writers, and manuscript studies, 1770 to 1830. She published her first monograph with Routledge in 2019, entitled The Collaborative Literary Relationship of Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Anna also works closely with Keats House in Hampstead, and she is the Director of Communications for the Keats Shelley Association of America and the Communications Officer for the British Association for Romantic Studies. She is currently working on various editing projects linking to the Shelleys, including with Kean Duffy, the first Oxford World's Classics edition of the History of a Six Weeks Tour. So we'll now begin presentations commencing with Anna, who is going to speak mm -hmm. to us on a shared journal and a shared journey leading to the one scene of Mont Blanc. Anna. Thank you so much, Amanda, for a lovely introduction. Um, and I just want to thank my co-organizers of the Shelley Conference again, who are a group of inspiring Shelleyans to work with. Um, so uh, it's been fantastic. Um, uh, I just want to say my internet has been slightly uh, dodgy today. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me, Amanda and Paul. Does it sound OK at the moment if I just keep going? Kian's nodding, thank you. Okay, so if I do just drop out, um, that's why, but fingers crossed this will all go smoothly. Um, thank you everyone for being in the audience today. So um, let's start with 1814 when we're thinking about Shelley and travel. I wanna start by thinking about one of the first pieces of paper shared by Percy Bysshe Shelley and Mary Shelley. In this short talk, I hope to show that Percy Bysshe Shelley's first two journeys through Europe are decisively recorded in what would become History of a Six Weeks Tour, published for the first time in 1817, which, as Amanda just mentioned, um, Kian and I are delighted to be editing for the Oxford World's Classics edition. Um, so the Shelley's original travel book project, which actually spans several years and culminating in the poetic achievement of Mont Blanc, is a fascinating way to envisage how Percy Shelley was inspired by two key aspects of travel, his surroundings and the company that he kept. And yes, I would like to reiterate that the introduction of Mary Shelley, then Mary Godwin, into his life was so very crucial. When the Shelleys eloped in the summer of 1814, the spirit of collaboration blossomed between them as they toured Europe. Uh, the great editor Betty T. Bennett has stated that as they traveled, the couple continued with their own writing and the Shelleys had the same kind of dual relationship as Godwin and Wollstonecraft. They had a passion for each other and a passion for writing. Mary Shelley began her journal in 1814. And although we think of this now as Mary Shelley's journal, her kind of documents of her travels, it is the first of the Shelleys many, many collaborations. The 1814 to 1815 journal has Shelley and Mary's journal book inscribed on the title page by Mary Shelley. And actually the first entries in the manuscripts uh, are in Percy Shelley's hand. So this record of their lives and indeed their travels would continue as a shared project throughout uh, uh, the Shelley's expeditions to the continent. And, um, 
It's important though to note that actually Percy Shelley's most extensive contribution to noting down the travels in the shared journal were in the first few months of the 1814 journal book. I'm just gonna show you an image of a manuscript now, if this works. Um, Okay, you should be able to see that okay, yeah. Um, so uh, this is a page from the uh, 1814. Um, and the scholar Mary Jean Corbett has shown here how you can see that Percy Shelley's opening entry traces the coming together of the pair, the transformation of I and she into a united we. So you can see kind of halfway down the page there, Mary Shelley makes her first contribution to the journal by completing one of Percy Shelley's sentences by writing, uh, Shelley was also Green and Chamonix and the encounter with the all important mountain. And on the 23rd of July, 1816, Mary Shelley notes in her journal that quote, in the evening, I copy Shelley's letter to Peacock. The following day, the 24th of July, 1816, shows the Shelleys at work on their literary efforts at the very same time, probably. Um, we can only assume so much, but we hope we can uh, ascertain some of these things. But uh, at that point, Mary Shelley's journal entry reads, uh, write my story, Shelley writes part of a letter. And the former refers to the draft of Frankenstein, of course, and the latter to a draft of Shelley's poem, Mont Blanc. So the shared travels are collected in the shared journal, which includes shared reading lists as well. And I've written elsewhere about the importance of the Shelley's crossing overs of influence when they both composed significant texts in 1816. The Shelleys came to Chamonix aware of the prescribed raptures of travelers. Individually and collaboratively, they began to subvert this expectation. Just checking, I'm still clear because I have an internet unstable notification. Thanks, Kian. <laughs> um, so yeah, as so I'm thinking about the, the raptures of um, travelers, so, so the, the Shelleys arrive um, in um, uh, Chamonix and they're aware that there's a kind of expectation about the way they should react to this certain landscape. So for example, we know that uh, William Hazlitt wrote about how the crossing of the Alps has quote, I believe, given some of our fashionables a shivering fit of morality, with Mont Blanc convincing travellers of, quote, the presence of the being of a god. Um, we know this all too well, of course, from uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem written uh, before Shelley's Mont Blanc, which is called Him Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix. Uh, appearing in 1802. Um, um, so of course, Percy de Shelley in writing his poem Mont Blanc is of course in part responding to this and Coleridge's musings are overtly religious. And he would even write in the preface to his poem that his response, even though we know he didn't actually go to this location um, to Mont Blanc was quote, who would be, who could be an atheist in this valley of wonders. So it was famously during his stay in Chamonix that Percy Shelley famously signed his name as Democrat, lover of mankind and atheist in the visitors books of the hotels. Uh, another important moment for Shelley and his reputation as a result of his travel and movement through Europe. So I just thought I had to bring out that famous fact. Lord Byron, whose own Alpine impressions were incorporated into his work in Child Harold Canto III, attempted to erase Shelley's inscriptions, but at least one was left untouched and reported back to England. So that fueled some of the attacks on Shelley in his own lifetime. Um, I'll just show you another manuscript image now, if I can. Um, so this is one manuscript copy of Mont Blanc in Percy Shelley's hand. Um, I think it's really interesting that within this notebook held in the British Library, the other poems uh, within this notebook from 1816 actually appear in Mary Shelley's hand, but this one is in Percy Shelley's hand. Um, interestingly, of course, as well, we have multiple versions of Mont Blanc. This uh, one titled Scene at the top is not the same version that we see published at the end of History of a Six Weeks Tour. So it's not the one that Kian and I are actually working with, but a different version. Um, and uh, Michael Erklentz has written about this in the Keats Shelley Journal. Um, here in this manuscript, we see a, a, a description of the mountain intended for private circulation. And the poem is then revised for public consumption 
in the travel book in history of a six weeks tour. So I'll just say a few words about the poem Mont Blanc itself, which I think is one of the, uh, well, certainly my favourite uh, Shelley in travel <laughs> and, uh, poem that I like to uh, think about. In its inconstancy and its wayward and inconclusive yet liberating argument, the poem Mont Blanc reworks its physical and emotional influences into various complex strands. So it's a topographical poem, but it doesn't represent a coherent philosophical doctrine. But Mont Blanc is so fascinating as a poem because it is a radical collection of ideas endued with potential. There are several features of the landscape as explored in the poem Mont Blanc um, that Shelley discusses that I think are particularly beguiling and telling when we think about how Shelley uh, responded to his um, external environment to uh, write this great poem. Shelley's unanswered question at the end of the verse, and we all know it, so I won't quote it here, can feel strangely conclusive as it offers vacancy as a potentially succinct definition of the scenes and ideas in the poem that are so contradictory and elusive. Mont Blanc depicts opposing qualities embodied in that one scene. And so the title of my talk, I was thinking about that letter uh, where Shelley exalts to uh, his friend Thomas Love Peacock. And remember, this is all one scene, um, which is really crucial. For example, uh, we have a variety of different contradictions in the poem. We have animations such as the rapid waves, the ceaseless motion and the restless gleam encountering a kind of tranquility, the still snowy and serene landscape. Silence conflicts with unresting sound and the eternal such as the waterfalls leaping forever uh, meet the ephemeral and changing. For example, quote, one legion of wild thoughts whose wandering wings now float above thy darkness and now rest. The glaciers in the poem are destructive, um, but they must also become, quote, the breath and blood of distant lands as their waters flow into the river Arve. William Keach has noted how the complexity of Shelley's rhyme scheme is a formal quality of Mont Blanc that is a means of marking, quote, the chaos and blankness, which are the poem's, quote, special concerns. And I just think this reading of Mont Blanc is so incredibly useful. Shelley uses a uh, repeated use of negatives, which is something Keach writes about. And um, therefore, Mont Blanc, quote, Questions simultaneously propose and interrogate in the poem, and the experience of blankness itself is both acknowledged and channel, challenged, as if the formal qualities of poetics must be complete and indefinite in order to describe these ineffable emotions. So the Shelleyan negations in the poem Mont Blanc and the contradictory nature of the one scene in which all life and death is exhibited demonstrates the strange paradoxical nature of the landscape and the feelings that it inspires. These equivocal musings recognize the mountain as alien and as a symbol of nature distance from man. Yet the poem purports to anthropomorphize Mont Blanc in some way or insists that human curiosity attends itself to the mountain. So by way of a kind of conclusion um, following these thoughts, um, perhaps Shelley's moment of travel with Mont Blanc shows this celebration of uncertainty. Um, uh, encountering the mountain and the scene is an ideal space for Shelley and philosophy to take hold. Anne Janowitz has written, and this is a really useful phrase that I like to use when explaining Mont Blanc to my students. Um, she writes, by not answering the question at the end of the poem, Shelley produces the frisson of sublimity within us. Um, and I think that phrase, the frisson of sublimity, is, is just so useful for explaining the way that there is a frisson of emotions. And that's how we can encapsulate the feelings of uncertainty that we are left with when we finish that poem. Um, maybe a way uh, to connect Shelley's poet speaker's uncertainty with that reflection on the view of the Alps, how to, how to summarize that in some way. Um, this all points to the idea that Shelley's encounter with the sublime in the Alps is perhaps his moment of Keatsian negative capability. So I would like to say that I think travel broadened the mind for Shelley, of course, but it also allowed him to feel um, feels stuck, um, uh, as his letters often imply, that we feel that he's frustrated with working through his ideas, but content with that state of unknowing all the more. 
And that is why Shelley and his movement across the European continent is so key to his poetical development. Thank you, Amanda. I'll pass back to you. Thanks so much, Anna. That was fascinating. Um, yeah, this journey you've taken us on through Shelley's, through the Shelley's collaborations, collectivity, and Shelley's uncertainty around travel is really interesting. And I love, I love this, especially this appearance of the Shelley's writing as a unified we that you've noted upon is so interesting. Um, so we'll continue our journey through the six weeks tour now, and we'll hand over to Kian Duffy, who's going to speak about the 1816 part and focusing on Rousseau in particular. Kian. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks for the introduction earlier on. And hello, everybody, again. Welcome to Denmark. Um, yeah, as Amanda has said, I'm going to speak about the Geneva's Letters part uh, of the six week tour. That's what I've been focusing on in the edition that Anna and I are doing. Um, it is an effect of the way that Romanticism has been constructed as a thing that texts like the Six Weeks Tour, or notably also Mary Wollstonecraft's letters written during a short residence, get lifted out of context and presented as original or distinctive to an extent even standalone work. Something odd happens when you take them out of context. Um, also, in the case of Six Weeks Tour, we see a kind of parallel version where Mont Blanc, the poem, is itself often lifted out from that originary context and read in a different way. And that, as Anna has said, is something that Michael Erkelens has written so very intelligently about. Um, part of our task uh, as editors has been, of course, to try and situate these texts back in the context from which they came. Um, and one thing that becomes quickly apparent if you do that, and I hope an audience of Shellians will forgive me for saying so, is in some respects just how unoriginal um, the Geneva letters are. Um, in many respects, they are entirely conventional. Um, but there are original aspects about them. Um, so what I thought I would talk with you about this evening um, is what's not so new uh, about Six Weeks Tour and what we might think is new in it. Um, the book itself, of course, starts off with that very defensive preface where the Shelleys tip their hands saying, look, we are somewhere where lots of people have been before, well-trodden scenes. They call them scenes which are now so familiar to our countrymen that few facts relating to them can be expected to have escaped the more experienced and exact observers who have sent their journals to the press. Um, so from the very start of the tour, um, it becomes apparent that the Shelleys are perhaps less interested in the facts about the places where they visit uh, and more interested in something else, more interested perhaps in the subjective response to those landscapes, or perhaps more interested in the cultural connotations which those landscapes have acquired. Um, cultural connotations which often bear an at best tenuous relationship to the actual facts. Um, particularly referring to the Chamonix and the Geneva letters, of course, the Shelleys in the preface describe um, that area as what they call classic ground, peopled with the tender and glorious imaginations of the present and the past. Um, classic ground is something I've written about before in relation to travel writing. Um, it's a fairly familiar trope, actually, and it's a fairly familiar phrase. Many people describe the Alps as classic ground. Um, but actually, it originates with Joseph Addison's letter from Italy, published in 1701. Um, and Addison uses it to describe the way in which cultural connotations are inscribed upon physical geography. So that when you go to a place which has very often been written or thought about, um, it's actually quite difficult to see it for what it really is, or for how the locals might see it, because it's very difficult to escape the cultural conditioning that you bring with you. Um, paradoxically, or perhaps not paradoxically, that process, of course, carries on today. It's very difficult for any of us, for example, to go to Chamonix and to see that place independently of what we know about, about the Shelleys. Um, and if you think this kind of idea of what a landscape might look like if you could see it outside the cultural baggage you bring with you um, sounds like the famous question at the end of Mont Blanc uh, that Anna mentioned earlier on, um, and I think you're absolutely right, and I'll come back to the significance of that later on. Um, the preface to Six Weeks Tour identifies <clears throat> two people, really, as the primary authors of the classic ground that that tour explores. Um, the first is the great poet, uh, Byron, um, whose writings about the Rhine and so on are really, really influential in the first part of the tour. 
But the single most substantial influence uh, on the Geneva letters, and I would suggest on the Pont Mont Blanc itself, is of course Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, whom Shelley describes as the greatest man the world has produced since Milton, the famous kind of Republican poet. Um, it is interesting and of course relatively well known that Shelley bases this assessment of Rousseau's stature, or at least Rousseau's stature as mediated in the Alps, um, not on his political writings, uh, but rather on his novel Julie, which is a tale, as the subtitle has it, of two lovers uh, living in a small village at the foot of the Alps. Um, and it is undoubtedly the case that Julie was probably the single most influential novel written during the 18th century. Um, again, we all know that Shelley, with Percy Shelley, with Byron, goes on a kind of Rousseau pilgrimage around Lake Geneva. He writes extensively about this, uh, visiting the scenes made famous by Rousseau's novel. And oddly enough, um, Shelley almost manages to drown uh, in the exact same place, he says, um, on Lake Geneva, uh, where two incidents of a similar nature occur uh, in Rousseau's novel. Uh, one where uh, Saint-Paul, the heroine, the hero, and his lover Julie are almost overset in a squall, and another where Saint-Paul considers ending it all and jumping into the lake with Julie. Um, so perhaps a particularly treacherous part of Lake Geneva, one might think, uh, or some kind of embellished geography potentially on Shelley's part. Although there's no doubt that the actual accident that Shelley went through took place. Um, this is very visible if you read through the Six Weeks Tour, this engagement with Rousseau, this engagement with the landscapes that Rousseau has celebrated, that Rousseau has made famous. Um, but it's entirely unoriginal. I mean, as long ago as 1798, Helen Mariah Williams was complaining about people doing exactly the same thing, running round the rocks above Myrie looking for saint Peur and Julie. And in fact, even Rousseau himself in his confessions anticipates that people might start doing this kind of thing um, and advises them not to <laughs> actually. Um, so these elements of the six weeks tour, which seem quite distinctive when lifted out of context, um, are very much the stock and trade for what tourists of various nationalities did in the environs of Geneva and the south shore of the lake at that time. And even the way in which Shelley registers the impact of Julie on the landscape, the way in which he registers how difficult it is to perceive the landscape without seeing it through those Rousseau lenses, um, is not original to Shelley. A great deal of British travel writing by people like William Cox or more mainstream guides, a great deal of European traveling writing, for example, Abel's Guide to Switzerland, make exactly the same points, not just about how accurate Rousseau's descriptions are, but how much those descriptions transform how we might feel when we go there, what we might see and how we might see it. So the idea that Rousseau's novel provides a kind of script for interacting with this part of the world um, is certainly not original to the Shelleys, far from it actually. Um, and one of the editorial challenges that Anna and I face um, has been the attempt to identify um, quite how many specific borrowings um, from guidebooks there are uh, in phrases which read out of context might seem particularly Shelleyan. And there's an awful lot of intertextual allusion, actually, to the kind of contemporary guidebooks that Shelley's must have been using, even though there's, there's no direct record that they have done so. So a lot of the tour is conventional. And a lot of what might seem romantic with a capital R to us uh, would have looked very much like the stock in trade of Alpine tourism uh, to contemporary readers at the time. But the Shelleys do go a little further than most people do, and Shelley, and Percy Shelley in particular, um, goes a little further than many do um, in, in his letters from Geneva and, and, and the, the six weeks tour versions of those. Um, and that is in the way in which Shelley is particularly interested in how Rousseau's writings have managed to transform what the landscape means. So Rousseau, uh, according to Shelley, has essentially rewritten the cultural significance of that part of the world. Um, and Shelley pays a great deal of attention um, to an incident, which is in fact true, we can verify that, where Marie Louisa, the Empress of Austria, stays in a really dodgy inn in Maori before it became a mainstream tourist attraction, um, in remembrance of Saint-Paul, uh, as Shelley puts it. 
Um, so what Shelley is very interested then is how Rousseau has the ability not only to transform the connotations of the landscape, not only to inscribe himself and his work onto the physical geography, but also, and perhaps moreover, to influence the ways in which other people relate to that landscape. Um, so in a sense, what Shelley sees Rousseau doing um, is engaging in a kind of cultural contestation about what the Alps mean, what the Alps signify, what the Alps are symbolic of. Um, and Shelley talks about these new Rousseauvian connotations in great detail, and he says in a very famous quotation from the Six Weeks Tour, they were created indeed by one mind, but a mind so powerfully bright as to cast a shade of falsehood on the records that are called reality, a phrasing which Shelley takes up very explicitly again in, 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 in Mont Blanc. Um, so that remark that Rousseau's imaginings are bright enough, are powerful enough to cast into doubt the records that are called reality, um, certainly looks forward to Shelley's later claims that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, that it is the authors of cultural texts who determine what we see, not perhaps what the reality of things are, but how we perceive that reality. In that respect too, um, it's very possible um, to see these kinds of statements and ideas by Shelley um, as looking forward to much more recent post-structuralist ideas about the relationship between representations and, and reality. And that when we talk about places, perhaps what we were really talking about is the way in which those places have been represented uh, rather than the places themselves. Um, the notion of records that are called reality, uh, of course, signals an awareness on Shelley's part that the real is up for grabs. It's something which can be contested. There is no absolute or definitive meaning to these places or to any places. Those meanings can be contested. And it is perhaps the text, the, the task of poets to do so. So, I mean, in the more immediate context of the Six Weeks Tour, and particularly of Shelley's poem Mont Blanc in the Six Weeks Tour, uh, one of the things that I think it's very possible to suggest is that it's Shelley's, Percy Shelley's awareness of what Rousseau did with that landscape, which is a much, much more operative cause for what Shelley is trying to do in Mont Blanc um, than any sort of philosophical debates might be. Um, the poem has often been read as, you know, evidence of Shelley's investigation of the rival claims of empiricism or idealism or skepticism or whatever else it, it might be. Um, and while not denying the possibility of reading that way, um, I think it's possibly much more likely that we can see that Shelley, Percy Shelley in Mont Blanc, is trying to do for that mountain what he had seen Rousseau do for the surrounding landscapes in Geneva. It is an attempt essentially to rewrite the cultural connotations of that mountain. Um, he doesn't talk about the records that are called reality, but he does, of course, in Mont Blanc, talk about large codes of fraud and woe, uh, which he claims are attached to that mountain. Anna has talked to us a little bit of what those codes might be. Partly they are conventional, pietist, to an extent monarchist uh, interpretations of the landscape. Um, but they are also a kind of catastrophist geology and an intended catastrophist politics. And again, as Anna has mentioned, um, Shelley, Percy Shelley is quite concerned to revise a catastrophist understanding of Mont Blanc uh, away from seeing it as, as, as an emblem of geological disaster, but seeing it rather um, as evidence of long-term meliorative change. Yes, the glaciers are a bit drastic if you're living at their foot, but if you live somewhere along the banks of the Rhone a very, very long way away, then there are meliorative consequences to be had from that action. And the way Shelley talks about, Percy Shelley talks about glaciation in Mont Blanc is exactly analogous to the way that he talks about the long-term effects of the French Revolution uh, in the Six Weeks Tour, where he's talking about the effects of Rousseau on producing the revolution. So he is, of course, talking about geological systems in the poem, but he's also talking about political systems when he's talking about the apparent effects of glaciation and the long-term effects of glaciation. He is also talking about the apparent short-term effects of the French Revolution and the long-term benefits that it might have, despite the apparent catastrophe of the present. 
Um, so I think one of the things that we can talk about that if we replace Mont Blanc and reread Mont Blanc within the context of the six weeks tour, we can see that it actually participates very clearly in the in the strong investment in Rousseauian thought and Rousseauian ideas that Shelley has there. And it is an attempt, as I said earlier on, really to do for Mont Blanc what Shelley believed Rousseau had done. Um, for the wider landscape in the Alps, to contest its cultural connotations, to make it mean something else, to have tourists go there and see something different, and not one worldview, um, but another. Interestingly, of course, however, the poem begs the question of what the mountain would actually be if we could see it apart from any kind of cultural lens. Um, and actually, the poem, to, me, to my mind at least, seems to imply that, that that's not possible. We can't see it irrespective of some kind of cultural condition. We cannot see Mont Blanc for what it actually is outside perception. All we can see Mont Blanc is, is in terms of how we represent it. Um, but rather than being a kind of nihilistic or relativistic conclusion, um, I think it actually plays very much into a wider Shelleyan philosophy or philosophy that Shelley developed certainly later in his work, which we can perhaps see beginning here in Mont Blanc, that yes, it may not be possible to get an authoritative view on reality. Yes, perhaps all we're dealing with is representations. Yes, perhaps all we have are the stories that we make up about the world. Um, but if that's the case, it's really, really important what stories we make up. It's really, really important what kinds of representations we use. Those things have a direct influence on the kinds of societies in which we live. Um, so in that sense, landscape for Shelley is not neutral. Um, and travel in that sense too is a highly ideological activity because as much as visiting places, um, you are visiting cultural spots, you are visiting classic ground landscapes which can be motivated in support of particular cultural or political positions. Um, that's an idea that becomes much more important uh, in Percy Shelley's work later, um, but I think we can contend that we see it beginning in the six weeks tour, and we see it beginning in Mont Blanc, and it owes its origins, I would suggest, to Shelley's understanding of what Rousseau had done in those same places about 70 years earlier. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kian, for that, for drawing our attention to, to the way that Shelley is doing this Rousseauian rewriting of Mont Blanc and the surrounding landscape, and for giving us an insight into this recontextualizing editorial practice you and Anna are doing. I'm really excited to read, to read this edition, this collaborative edition. Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to stay a bit with the theme of the Six Weeks Tour and move on to Benjamin who's going to be consider considering Shelley's April 1818 to April 1819 Italian letters to Peacock as proto travel collections in the manner of the history of a six weeks tour. So I hand over now to Benjamin. Sorry, I just need to unmute there. Uh, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Anna and Amanda, for organizing this event. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, 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 colleagues that, whose, whose work I know but have not met. And uh, it's, it, this is a, a, a delight. Um, as Anna, Amanda says, I'm going to be looking at those letters to Peacock uh, between 6 April and 6 April uh, 1819. And I obviously cannot summarize them, but I'm going to think more a little bit about um, this business about originality and unoriginality uh, that uh, Kian brought up. Um, the, with the history of the Six Weeks Tour, freshly in print, the Shelleys ventured on a new continental tour in March 1818, uh, this time in the pursuit of Shelley's health in Italy. Uh, Shelley resumed his travel letters to Thomas Love Peacock, the recipient of the two concluding letters in the Six Weeks Tour, signed S the prospect that these letters too might form the basis of a published travelogue was lost on no one. Responding to Shelley's journal letters on Bologna and Rome, Peacock enthused, if you bring home a journal full of such descriptions, they will attract a very great share of public attention. Mary Shelley had alerted Peacock to this possibility in a postscript to the Bologna letter, which she copied out in her own hand to save space take care of these letters because I have no copies and I wish to transcribe them when I return to England, she writes. 
Her fair copy already indicates how transcription might have flowered into collaboration. Several insertions appear, as Frederick Jones has noted, in, Mary in Mary's hand, excuse me, in Mary's copy and hand only. For his part, Shelley ostensibly rejected Peacock's overtures. Besides, I keep no journal, he protested. But he too had kept a weather eye on publication. In the earlier 6th November letter from Ferrara, he follows up a very Shellian statement. I always seek in what I see the manifestation of something beyond the present and tangible object with a playful riff on the six weeks tour that would not have been lost on Peacock. His comment, but my business is to relate my own sensations and not to attempt to inspire others with them echoes the earlier work where he writes, I too have read the raptures of travelers. I will be warned by their example. I will simply detail to you all that I can relate or would enable you to conceive of what we have done or seen. Mary Shelley turned to the letters from Italy after Shelley's death, but the execution of her intentions succumbed to Timothy Shelley's embargo and the collection remained unpublished until essays letters from abroad in 1839. At that late date, one can see how Mary Shelley might have molded the materials earlier. She skillfully opens with an establishing letter of 22 March 1818 to Lee Hunt from Lyon, beginning, why did you not wake me that night before we left England? And then footnotes and excerpt from her journal in Shelley's hand detailing their journey from Lyon over the Alps. The first of the letters to Peacock from Milan follows naturally from here, and the Peacock letters form the backbone of the collection until the spring of 1819. Mary Shelley's earlier interpolations surviving intact, but now presented as Shelley's own, amongst other signs of careful editing. With Letters from England becomes, uh, Letters from England becomes a looser collection with the addition of multiple correspondence. But Mary Shelley's preface accords the Letters to Peacock a special status. These are written, she notes, in a similar spirit of observation and remark to the letters from Geneva. In hindsight, she argues that Shelley pursued a similar method in all of his descriptions by looking, and here she paraphrases the letter I've already quoted, beyond the actual object for an internal meaning, typified, illustrated, or caused by the external appearance. He aims, she suggests, to develop irrefragible canons of taste for appreciating the sublime and beautiful in works of art. So what happens when we think about the letters from Italy to Peacock as a travelogue in its own right? First, let's consider Shelley's disclaimers. Most prominent is his response to Peacock that he is more pleased to interest you than the many and has no idea of attempting the latter. But these are stock claims of the modesty topos prevalent in travel prefaces. The persuasion of friends are frequently cited for overcoming such reluctance. Then there are Shelley's frequent critical remarks on fellow English travelers, his disparagement of tourism and the language of tourism. The tourists tell you all about these things and I'm afraid of stumbling upon their language. His self distancing from the mainstream, I don't pretend to taste. His sniping at a specific traveler in Bologna, consult Eustace if you want to know nothing about Italy. And in Rome, his singling out the travel writers John Cam Hobhouse, Eustace, and Joseph Forsyth as purveyors of show knowledge. But in all of these ways, Shelley demonstrates what James Bizard has called a conventional anti tourism, a rhetorical defense against the writer's own belatedness in an overdetermined scene. In reality, Shelley's letters engage creatively with the language of travelers, particularly Eustace whose liberal neo-Hellenism prevents Shelley from rejecting outright the more unpalatable religiosity and anti-Gallicism. Try as he might to distance himself from other writers, the very gesture draws him closer to them. And in the letters from Italy as a whole, a sense of cohesion and counterpoint emerges. Shelley was also among the first travel writers for whom Byron's Child Harold Canto IV forms a substantial intertext. 
is balancing in counterpoint of Byron and Eustace in the texture of his observations and in the poetry, notably lines written among the Eugenian Hills and Mazengi, anticipates Murray's commercial practices in the later guidebooks. Where Shelley does make his mark is with a heightened sense of literary tourism, a theorization of touristic on the spot observation, but focusing specifically on poetry, art, sculpture, architecture, as well as the forces of nature. In the six weeks tour, the figure of Rousseau, as Keane has suggested, galvanized this approach. It was Rousseau who cast a shade of falsehood on the records that are called reality. There, the disorientating effects of sublime encounter are recast in writerly terms. All was, a, all was as much our own as if we had been the creators of such impressions in the minds of others as now occupied our own. The two impulses come together in Shelley's notes on Raphael's Saint Cecilia from the Bologna letter. You forget that it is a picture as you look at it, and yet it is unlike any of those things which we call reality. Saint Cecilia seems wrapped in such inspiration as produced her image in the painter's mind. This reflexivity is well known to Shelleyans in other contexts. The defense, for example, where the eye, like the mind, cannot see itself unless reflected on that which it resembles. A motif worked out in a laster Prometheus Unbound or the Triumph of Life. His contemporary fragment Colosseum, however, best sums up the letters from Italy, for Shelley there anatomizes touristic observation and imaginative reconstruction in the figures of two unusual tourists, a blind man and his daughter, she describing all that can be related of the Roman ruin, and he poetically, associatively, transforming that which she relates into vitally metaphoric prose poetry. Reading backwards to the letters themselves, we see perhaps Shelley's own model for their future use, not only as a proto-travelogue, but as a mine of imagery and ideas for the poetry he was writing and which he planned to write. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Benjamin. That was wonderful. Um, and really followed on so well from Anna's talk in, in this continued posthumous idea of collaboration and transcription flowering into collaboration in Mary's hand. That was really wonderful. I hope we can pick these themes up again in, in the discussion. Um, so we're going to move now on to Nahoko. And Aoko is going to speak to us about traveling fragments, specifically a fragment that traveled from England to Tokyo. Aoko. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for Anna and <coughs> um, Anna and Amanda for organizing this session. And uh, I'm very glad to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about not the travel of the Shelley's, but the travel of a uh, fragment written by Shelley. Um, it is the only known manuscript in Shelley's own hand that is outside the UK, Europe, and the US. On July 8, 1922, the manuscript was shown to a small number of Japanese scholars of English when they celebrated the centenary of Shelley's death at the Imperial University of Tokyo. The facsimile edition uh, facsimile appeared with a caption, Shelley's MS in Japan, in Shelley Memorial Volume, published by the English Department of Imperial University of Tokyo in February 1923. If Western scholars had come across a copy of Shelley Memorial Volume, they would have thought the manuscript was lost in the Tokyo Yokohama earthquake of 1923, which completely destroyed the greater Tokyo area. Um, when did this manuscript travel all the way to Japan and how did it survive catastrophic disasters and reappear digitalized with a new title fragment of an address to the Jews? That's what I'm going to talk about and um, I will share the screen. Um, Uh, this is the first page of the manuscript. And uh, on the top right hand side of the manuscript was vertically written 
um, presented to Mr. R. Stray by R. Gar R. Garnett by 1920, uh, 1902, are magnified uh, this part. This. Mr. R. Stray was Binkichi Stray, a well known Japanese poet scholar whose pen name was Bansui Doi. Bansui means green leaves in the, in the season of winter decay. Rinkichi Tsuchi left Japan in June 1901 after resigning from number two Imperial High School, which later became part of Tohoku University. He arrived in Lon London in August. This is the beginning of his three year sojourn in Europe. He was from an old wealthy family and his father financially supported his grand tour. While studying English literature and German literature, he traveled widely composing poems, which are later collected as lyrics by a noble youth from the Eastern seas, a sort of Bansui's version of Child Harold pilgrimage. We do not know how Bansui, how, how Bansui met Garnet and why Garnet decided to give this young Japanese poet one of the manuscripts Sapashi Shelley and Lady Shelley had presented to him. Well, quite different in terms of age and cultural background, Garnet and Bansley had much in common. They were poets, polyglots, and interested in translating, uh, interested in translation, especially translating Homer. Above all, they had a passionate love for Shelley. The new political development, the first Anglo-Japanese alliance signed in London in January 1902, might have been at the back of Garnet's mind when he decided to give this particular manuscript to Bansui. In, August, in October, Bansui left London to the continent. He was traveling for the next two years, carrying the manuscript with him. From London by a Rouen, Bansui arrived in Paris. He had an extensive tour in Italy from February 1903, going to Rome, Florence, Naples, and Sicily. In Rome, he visited the grave of Shelley and composed a poem on visiting Shelley's grave. The manuscript went with Bansui from Italy to Switzerland and Germany. At Leipzig, Bansui found some secondary materials on Shelley's work and he wrote to Garnet on December 30, 1903. I quote, if you would like to see them, I shall be very glad to present you with them. He may be wanted to, <coughs> he, may, <coughs> he may be wanted to make a present in return for the gift of the manuscript. In this letter, Bansui wrote, he would come back next summer to England. In February 1904, the Russo-Japanese war broke out. The European routes to Japan were all closed. All Japanese ships on the European route were requisitioned by the Imperial Japanese Navy. Though the war continued, the European routes were opened again in July. Bansi came back from Germany to England from where he returned to Japan. The manuscript accompanied Bansi's homeward voyage and arrived in Yokohama on November 20, 1904. Then it traveled north to Sendai Miyagi, where Bansi resumed teaching at number two Imperial High School. After traveling around Europe, the manuscript went from England to Japan during the Russo-Japanese War. It was in Tokyo at the time of Shelley's centenary celebration on July 8, 1922. It escaped Tokyo Yokohama earthquake of 1923, and it also escaped the Great Air Raid of Tokyo on March 10, 1945, toward the end of the Second World War. But it was in Sendai on July 10, when the bombing of Sendai completely burned down Bansui's house, and his 30,000 books were all reduced to ashes. The manuscript had a narrow escape from a wartime fire. Bansui died in Sendai in 1952. The Shelley manuscript and two letters from Garnet 
were delivered in person by Yoshiki Nakano, Bansai's grandson, to the main library of the University of Tokyo in 1966. The manuscript, the manuscript was registered at the library on November 24 with the donator's name, Toru Nakano, Yoshiki's younger brother, who succeeded the Bansai's family. A card index catalog of rare book library at the main library of the university listed as a manuscript written in his own hand. The existence of this manuscript had been forgotten until Professor Toko Tatsuo discovered and rediscovered it in the 1980s. I believe Professor Nolaku is the first non-Japanese after Garnet who actually saw the manuscript. She renames it Fragment of an Address to the Jews. It took a bit of time to have it digitalized with the accompanying items, but now it is available from anywhere in the world. Thank you very much. Oh, cool. thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. This this history of this fragment and all it survived, all the places it's been. It's wonderful and now it's available to us worldwide. Thank you for introducing us to, to this fragment again. Uh, that was fantastic. Thanks, thanks to all of our speakers. Um, I think I'm going to ask a quite just broad ranging question of all of you because your talks have all touched upon points that I'm that I'm interested in in Shelley's travels from influence of travel writers of his day and how he distanced himself from those influence of his travels on his poetry. So I wonder if I can ask you just, just a quite broad question. Had Shelley not died, where do you think he would have traveled to next? Shall I take that one? Mm -hmm. I mean, almost certainly Greece, I guess, since he talks extensively about planning to do so. Um, whether he would have done so, of course, is anyone's guess, but that seemed to be next on the agenda. Um, back to England, I mean, he talks in a letter uh, about perhaps needing to go back to England to fight. Um, he talks in another letter about definitely not going back when his father dies. It's an interesting sense of priorities there, one, one might think. Um, but I guess um, Greece or the Levant would, would be sort of the most likely, I, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I would, uh, that would, that would be the answer I would have given had I gone first. <laughs> but uh, I, I should say that maybe, maybe even something more local, because I think in the notes to the poems of 1820, Mary Shelley at least uh, suggests that they were uh, planning on visiting, she says, other parts of Italy, but for the, uh, for the worries of their child, Percy Florence, uh, after uh, the deaths of all the others. So uh, they kind of st uh, stayed put, but so that begs the question of where else in Italy might they have gone, and, and that's not when you when you think about it, uh, they, they, what they had already done in Italy maps uh, pretty uh, strenuously onto uh, the the general itineraries of people like Lady Morgan or Charlotte Eden or uh, Eustace or you know many of the other writers on on, on Italy. Um, they've already done all the beaten track. Uh, how far off would they have gone? My, my suspicion is, uh, since uh, sailing is, is on the agenda, uh, Sicily might have been the, the, the place, uh, especially with uh, its political overtones, that might have uh, attracted Shelley within Italy uh, next. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the, 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 of course, as, as Kian suggests, uh, Greece, uh, you know, Shelley and uh, through Medwin uh, were actually planning a, a voyage to Greece and the, and the Levant, which never came off. And I, one can certainly see him in following through with that. And perhaps Greece with the rise of the revolution might have been a little bit tricky for him. I doubt he would have gotten, felt uh, empowered to go with Byron. Um, so uh, he, he might have settled for the Levant and possibly Egypt. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I actually think this is such a great question that we have so many uh, fans and distinguished Shellians in our audience. Maybe it's something we need to poll the audience for. <laughs> Send around to all the, the Shellians we know. Where where would he have gone next? Um, too many answers, maybe. But yeah, I've got to say Greece, right? Yes, I agree that uh, Greece is also the place where Shelley's father uh, suggested Shelley to go when he was expelled from Oxford, I think. 
about that. Um, as for the, uh, uh, as for sort of some more exotic ways, um, sort of thinking of uh, the letter Shelley wrote to the Peacock in the autumn, in the autumn of 1821, he was, uh, Shelley was dreaming of going to India. And uh, Peacock said that it's practically impossible. And I'm not really sure if um, Shelley's Indian project remained in Peacock's mind, but Peacock would draw up the pra practical plans of steam navigation of the Ganges. And uh, those plans were approved by the East India Company in 1831. So uh, if uh, Shelley had lived longer, um, Shelley would have embarked on an uh, entirely new sphere of action, as he said, uh, as he referred to as an Indian project, by going involved with, uh, by, by being involved with Peacock's plan for the steam navigation of the Ganges, and Shelley and the Shelley's would have taken a steamboat trip going up to the source of the Ganges. And um, Peacock also was uh, thinking of uh, working on Egyptian and Syrian route to India, uh, sea route. Uh, which couldn't have taken by the poet in Alastra. He went, he went to uh, India on the overland route, which nobody had ex explored yet at the time. But uh, st steam navigation would have changed the things completely different, I think. Yeah, thank you for that. It's fascinating to think about, isn't it? Um, I can see we have some questions coming through from the audience already. So I'm going to head, ahead and turn, turn things over to the audience. Um, we had a question quite early on from Anna Romanelli, and I'm not sure if you'd like to come on screen and ask your question, or would you like me to pose it to the speakers? I'll, I'll go ahead and ask Anna's question on her behalf. And Anna, if you, okay, she said she'd like me to read it. Um, so Anna's asked, are the travel journals something that Shelley started doing with Mary, or can we see an attempt of it with Harriet during Shelley's travels in the UK and Ireland? My sense of it is that uh, I don't think there are any surviving journals uh, that are kept by Shelley and Harriet. So, uh, from that sense, I think we, we the, the records are the early Shelley letters themselves. And um, it, it seems to me that Shelley's um, consciousness of, of travel as a discourse really gets going with the Six Weeks Tour or really with, um, with uh, the, you know, the actual travels that make up the Six Weeks Tour. So from 18, 18 16 onwards, uh, the others might disagree with me on that. But um, it, it seems before then, uh, Shelley is traveling uh, quite hectically and, and pursuing political projects and taking some notice of uh, landscape uh, in Wales and in um, and writing poetry, like on uh, leaving uh, London for, for Wales, um, Ellen the retrospect, so there's topographical uh, poetry going, uh, going on. But when you look at the prose, um, it, it seems to be preoccupied with the social and political issues rather than um, the landscape. Uh, and if, occasionally he'll, he'll be describing a landscape and he'll break off and say, but I, I don't have time to, for this now. Um, so you, you, it seems to be taking a backseat, uh, that kind of travel discourse that, that, that he seems much, so much more comfortable with uh, after 1814. So I think it's really with uh, the, the explosion of tourism after, after uh, the Napoleonic Wars, and they're joining in with that. And, and of course, uh, reading uh, Wollstonecraft on, while, while on, those, on that tour, um, the consciousness of travel and travel discourse comes to the fore. Uh, they're keeping a journal together. They're doing the, all the things that tourists are doing. Uh, but I don't see a sense of that quite in the same capacity in the earlier work for, for the reasons that I've enumerated but the others might have a, a, a different take on that. Yeah, no, no, I very much agree. I think there's this question of uh, Harriet and Shelley traveled a lot, right? Um, uh, um, so 
you know, but we don't have quite as much access to that idea of what they were maybe writing together if they were. So we just can't know. Um, I think maybe there is the point of um, something kind of uh, being collaboratively written. We do know for concrete certainty happens in 1840 not just the travel journal but the uh, Shelley is working on the assassins which is something Mary Shelley is involved in um so there the starts that kind of not that we're saying that he didn't do anything like that with Harriet but I suppose there's just the 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 point we have more kind of proof that, that this kind of germination of, of him and Mary Shelley's creative relationship is very, uh, uh, well, not very easy to trace, but is much more present um, in what we have to trace. And I don't know, um, I feel like this is a question we should actually ask you, Amanda, but I feel like um, what Ben was just saying there about uh, how he kind of talks a bit about the landscape a bit pre-1814, but then says, no, I must come back to, to what I'm focusing on. Um, uh, you know, is it, am I right to say that Shelley's kind of later manuscripts are the ones that are more covered with the pictures of trees and boats and hills and uh, mountains? And, um, and maybe that's maybe that's not true. I might be making an error there. But but that, but that kind of yeah flourish of imagination uh, attached to the landscape does seem to be when he gets to Europe. Yeah, no, it's interesting to think about this flourishing of the visual imagination in Europe and perhaps influenced by Mary as well, um, someone who can understand his own thoughts as, as Peacock phrases it. Um, Kian or Nahoko, would you like to comment on that, on Harriet's uh, travels with Shelley? I mean, I suppose I could add that the letter is the mode par excellence of travel writing in the latter part of the 18th century. And in addition, I suppose, I mean, we have a tendency today to think of the letter as a private genre in a way that it really wasn't in the late 18th and early 19th century, or at least not necessarily so. Um, so whilst it certainly isn't the case that we see kind of published travel material like the Six Weeks Tour, it's not a massive stretch, I think, to things like some of the local descriptive letters uh, from Wales or from Ireland, which do move between topographical description um, to more sort of, you know, reflection on immediate political concerns or personal concerns. I mean, that's not the stuff of the kind of traveling guides that, that emerge in, in the early 19th century. Um, but just comparing to some of the stuff that I've worked on recently, sort of early sort of 18th, early 19th century, or late 18th century British travel writing about Scandinavia, for example, uh, very often exhibit similar characteristics. You can think even of Mary Wollstonecraft's letters, for example, things which begin life as actual correspondence. Um, so it may be there, just not in a form that we quite recognize today, um, if, if we compare to things like the Six Weeks Tour. Uh, but I think in, in the correspondence from Ireland, in the correspondence from Wales, um, we see the Shelleys indulging in sort of creative practices that, that certainly could have become travel writing had they published it uh, in, 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 that, in that sense. That there isn't a great distance, I think, uh, between redacted versions of, of, of some of those letters. And of course, we can also see that with the six weeks tour. I mean, a lot of the house hunting stuff with Peacock and so on and so forth is left out of the versions of the Geneva letters um, that, 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 that are published. So it may be there, but just not so obvious or not in, in the terms that we're used to looking for, uh, I think would be my, my response to that. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I mean, it's it's so much the job of the editor of you two for recontextualizing this the, these texts for us. Um, thank you, Nahoko. Would you would you like to add anything to this? Actually, uh, I just totally agreed, and I learned a lot from um, from uh, from the uh, uh, comment. Um, I I don't think that uh, um, Shelley and Harriet should wrote should share the sort of that. Um, uh, Travel impression together and uh, wrote it down, but it's more like the sort of that uh, uh, Mary and Shelley start, uh, Mary and Percy started writing these things because those things that they encountered in Europe are completely new to them. Uh, they couldn't really expect, and also the languages and customs are quite different. Uh, that sort of that invite them to write down everything, uh, not everything, but. Uh, just the sort of that. Uh, in addition to uh, what Kian said, 
uh, classic backlog, they would like the new sensations and the new findings, uh, which only only those two share, I think. Yeah, that's a great, great point about unfamiliarity, the way that unfamiliarity yeah. causes inspiration yeah. in a way that perhaps they just didn't encounter, Harriet and Percy didn't encounter. Thank right. you. Right, thank you. Um, we have another question from Patrick. Um, Patrick, I'll just read your question out here, but feel free to come on the screen if, if you'd like to. Patrick says, can any of the speakers explain why Shelley is more disparaging of locals than most other romantic tourists? I see Patrick is here. Patrick, would you like to add anything to that, to that question? No, no, okay. Um, yeah, it makes me so, think. Of it. Sorry, I forgot to switch on the, the speaker. Um, particularly in the, during the Swiss travels, but in Italy as well, Shelley speaks um, very disparagingly of the locals in general. Um, and I, I have explanations for it, but I was curious to know what the, the speakers had to say about this. I mean, could I perhaps yeah. come up with disparaging yeah. suggest because he's a young man <laughs> and that to a certain extent is what a certain kind of young man does. Um, but there's not perhaps a thing to say out loud in front of an audience of, Shell <laughs> an audience of Shellians, but it doesn't necessarily speak volumes for his character, I think one, one could say. But, but it is also to an extent a pose, uh, and I don't mean a pose in, in a negative or, a, or a patronizing, but, but it is a position that a traveller often takes. And Benjamin Colbert mentioned that earlier on, that, that, that idea that, that everyone else as a tourist, uh, we ourselves are always travelers. It's always, it's always other people that, 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 that are tourists. Um, but I, I, even if we're engaging in the same kinds of activities as all the other tourists, um, I, I, I do think in Shelley's case, a, a particular political agenda has a lot to do with it. Uh, and an attempt, again, a little bit like various amongst us, I suppose, we're talking about to separate out the possibility of wanting to visit and engage with these places from the operative connotations that such places um, might have had at the time, uh, which is something that I think all of us uh, as travelers or tourists um, perhaps, perhaps suffer from to, to an extent when, when, when we go to places. Um, but many of the places that Shelley visited were really, really established as tourist traps, um, had very significant cultural connotations attached to them. And therefore perhaps there needs to be some reason to justify following the beaten track going to those places, um, but as well an attempt to try and reclaim them to say, well, all right, okay, 99% of you think that this place is about this, but actually it might be possible to think about it as something else. So, so, so it, 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 it's, it's complicated, I, I think, um, but there's a certain amount of young man attitude in it, I, I think as, as well, when it comes down to it, if I can be so unkind as to say so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um, it, Shelley's got a, a long record of um, kind of disparaging locals. Uh, I mean, and uh, I, when he's writing to Elizabeth Hitchner back in uh, during the Irish expedition and talking about uh, 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 the animated intellect, and then in another letter he talks about the Irish people as being one mass of animated filth, kind of recycling that imagery. And I mean, that, that seems like a, a pretty bold instance, but um, the, 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 that kind of um, dichotomy between the, the, the ideals or uh, looking at art or uh, landscape and then looking over at um, local peoples and seeing uh, another word he likes to use quite a bit later on is uh, degradation or de the degraded uh, people, etc. And we see that in in uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, in in the Alps, uh, with the, uh, the people with uh, iodine deficiencies, and it's them kind of interpreting uh, morally. Uh, we see that in Italy, especially with uh, when he's looking at uh, at women, and uh, he can't seem to, to to take women who eat garlic. Uh, we we that, that happens in, in several letters. Um, there's uh, you know, it's it's all over the place in Shelley, and it's it, it, and it's not pleasant uh, necessarily. But having said that, um, it's also not um, it, it's part of the travel writing landscape as well. 
I'm, I'm thinking of John Scott's travels to France in, um, in a visit to Paris and Paris revisited, uh, in which he, he just decimates the French uh, in, in terms of uh, the de degradation of the uh, post-Napoleonic character. Excuse me, yes, and, and, and he, he, he has very uh, uh, dark things to say and, and focuses again uh, on women in particular. Uh, and we, we, then we get the counterblast to that with uh, Lady Morgan's France in, in 1817, which Shelley did read. Um, which starts with a, a long analysis of the peasantry to show exactly how they have been transformed uh, by the revolution and by uh, even the no, no, Napoleonic preservation of, of reforms. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of debate going on be, uh, about national character uh, in travel writing in France, in this case, but also in Italy. Uh, and so we can also see Shelley's uh, disparagement in those contexts. It still doesn't put it necessarily in a good light, uh, but we, we do find Shelley continually grappling with um, the disparity between those who he would like to see reformed and the present state of their manners. Um, and you know, all the way back at, in the beginning, uh, back in, in uh, 1813, uh, in, in the voyage, a fragment, I, I found this uh, earlier. Uh, he says, oh, why is a rapt soul e'er recalled from the palaces of vision bliss to the cells of real sorrow? You know, this, this, this discrepancy, this reluctance at some, in, in sometimes to, to kind of face um, the, 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 the the difficulties that the unreformed populace are facing. I mean, if, if I could possibly just, just add briefly to that as well, and to, to the point about how sort of your question about what, why is Shelley sort of more noted for this than, than, than other travellers. I mean, if you think of Mary Wollstonecraft in Scandinavia, I mean, from start to finish, she hasn't a good word to say about anything. People go out of their way to be nice to her. Um, and, and all she offers is criticism. Um, she complains about there being too many hospitals in Copenhagen. <laughs> and, the of, you know. and it's really good, that there's a kind of paradox because the kind of attitudes, and Ben, you were talking about too, the attitudes that Shelley sometimes expresses are ones which are radically insist in inconsistent with much of his politics. And it's the same with Mary Wollstonecraft in Scandinavia, and particularly Mary Wollstonecraft in Denmark. Mary Wollstonecraft really, really, really ought to like what she sees in Copenhagen. Um, but for some reason, she just doesn't. Uh, and that. So, so he's not altogether unrepresentative, I, I think, either. Is that the family tradition, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, and that's the real parallel, the, the Wollstonecraft text. I agree with you, King. Yeah. Uh, Anna, did you want to come in and say anything to that? Um, we do have another question. Oh, sorry. We do have another question in the chat that kind of ties into Wollstonecraft very much. So it's from someone with a, a kind of encrypted screen name, though. So I'm not sure who you are. It's LMV118. Um, I'll just I'll briefly read out your question unless you'd like to come on screen. Um, so this individual. Oh, is it Lisa Vargo? Oh, Lisa. I was uh, going to say is that Lisa. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry, my Zoom always switches back to <gasps> my university's NSID, and I forgot to change it. No, that's um, okay. It was a mistake. Uh, but um, you could read the question out loud. I, I just would like to say thank you for four amazing papers. You've made my day. Uh, so, though I've got a lot more of it to go uh, than some of you do. <laughs> Uh, but if you could read the question, that would be fantastic. Thank yeah, you. Of course. Lovely to see you, Lisa. Um, so Lisa asks, I have a question about other contributors to the history of a six weeks tour. Ben has mentioned Mary Wollstonecraft as an inspiration for their travel letters as well with respect to Kean's very compelling argument about Percy wanting to contest cultural connotations. Where does Byron and Child, Her Child Herald's view of landscape and Child Herald three serve as a sort of dialogue with Shelley? Uh, Percy makes clear they are in debate about Rousseau and Gibbon, and Byron complains about Shelley dousing him with Wordsworth. Um, 
Should, should I come perhaps on, on, on that yeah, one then? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a super question. Uh, I mean, what is it? A highly sort of intertextual book. And of course, in, in, in the Byron case, it's particularly difficult because many of the sort of intertexts we assume will have happened in conversations uh, of, of, of which there is no extant record in that sense. Um, we can see divergences certainly uh, emerging is there around figures like, like Gibbon. Uh, Byron is slightly more practical uh, on, on certain matters, um, but a little bit more worldly in, in, in some senses than, 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 than Shelley. Um, but I think I would see, I mean, those two texts more in conversation with, with each other than perhaps has been registered in, in, in previous criticism on the, the, the subject. It's not one-way traffic in that it's not so the Shelley somehow imposing himself uh, on Byron to, to write Child Harold III that way. And I think there's, there's a lot of Child Harold III or the ideas that will become Child Harold III uh, all, all, also in Shelley. Um, but there's also a lot of kind of third party sources. I mean, the discussion of the beam, for example, the famous beam in, 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 in the Chateau de Chillon, um, th that episode, both Byron and Shelley take from somewhere else. I mean, that there are various other contemporary travel guides that, that describe those scenes, which they have, of course, themselves seen and which talk about it in that way. But there are kind of texts outside both the Six Weeks Tour and Child Harold, I think, which are having a kind of influence there. And that's part of the things that Anna and I have been trying to uncover, the sources that both Shelley and Byron draw on in, in, in that sense, that the books that they were both familiar with in that way. Um, but I would see it more as a kind of dialogue um, than, than one-way traffic either way. And in very practical terms, one of the things that Anna and I have also been thinking about is what, what we might include as kind of appendices or paratexts in our edition. I mean, what, 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 what bits, for example, of Byron's poetry or passages from Byron's journalism might, 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 might go in there. But what struck me, at least, is, is how both Child Harold and the Six Weeks Tour are in conversation with other sources, uh, uh, actually. So, so, so rather seeing Shelley and Byron as the kind of primary influences on each other, there are in fact kind of third parties in, 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 in travel writing and so on, which, which are also very, very influential, uh, I, I think. Thank you so much. I mean, I absolutely agree that it's a conversation, uh, you know, rather than an influence per se, but it fascinates me what your approach will be to editing the text and you know how you will bring in uh, these other references. And I guess I would um, agree if, if we are in agreement, then maybe these other sources are, are more uh, important to uncover uh, rather than worrying about you know Byron's place uh, in, in, the, in the text. But um, this text by two people, then has you know other people uh, whose presence is there, like Peacock and Byron and Mary Wollstonecraft, but then so many, uh, to me at least, unknown writers that that you're uncovering. So your editorial method, you know, what you'll do with the text just sounds fascinating. So thank you very much. I just interject uh, there. Um, there. There's that really interesting moment in the uh, the journal part of the six weeks tour where. Uh, 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 the, the narrator, our narrator says, we, we read these verses with delight. We read these verses with delight. We refer to Child Herald uh, three, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, description of the Rhine tour. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a strange moment because it's kind of spliced right in the middle of a paragraph that's kind of taking place in the so-called present of 1814. And you don't really at first know whether to read that read as present tense or a past tense. Uh, but quickly you figure out it must be past tense. We've read these these verses with delight uh, after the fact. So there's there's a moment in, embedded in the text of the dialogue, I suppose that uh, Kian was talking about, but it becomes uh, part of that act of travel writing as retrospection, travel writing as revision, travel writing in which the writing itself happens after the actual travel uh, it, the travel, the writing attempts to recreate the travel, but at this moment we have that window open and we see other texts intervening in between uh, the scene of travel itself and the writing of travel. And, uh, and that kind of thing, I think, is something that is fascinating uh, in, in Shelley in, in a larger sense, because we often get um, like images or motifs uh, 
uh, in, say, Mary Shelley's journal that shows up in the Leicester and then comes back into the rewritten or the, re the, re the revised version of the Six Weeks Tour in this kind of uh, dialogue happening uh, between the poetry and the prose as well. Uh, but I, that, uh, that instance of, of Byron's uh, stanzas from, from the Rhine being inserted into the tour, I thought was a really fascinating one. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, uh, I was simply going to add that I think sometimes maybe it speaks to the really interesting rivalry between Byron and Shelley that, that actually the more kind of direct quotations of Byron, I feel like crop up a lot more in Mary Shelley's work, like that phrase palaces of nature is something that Mary Shelley directly inserts into her own work. Um, there's Shelley and Byron, a little bit more tension going on, maybe. Um, but I don't know if Nahoko has anything to add. Um, no, I can't, I can't really add anything. I just sort of that, uh, uh, totally agree with what you said. I'd say it's more like a conversation rather than competition. Um, yes. Uh, but just, uh, I, I'd like to go back to that uh, previous topic about uh, the scholars between the, uh, just a sort of that uh, Shelley uh, recorded only sort of. Uh, uh, Shelley often sort of that uh, pointed out the sort of that the uh, uh, bad aspect of local people, and in that, uh, um, I'm just sort of that uh, uh, reading it through his uh, in in connection with his poems he wrote in that sort of actual sort of that uh, uh, places he wherever he went. He just found the traces of sort of man-made diseases such as commerce, tyranny, and religion, and he couldn't really point it out, uh, find it in local people's attitude. But um, sort of that the Shelley as a poet, uh, trying to sort of improve, not improve, but sort of going through that sort of that. The, but uh, those bad customs and bad uh, bad behavior of the people, uh, for example, um, I'm sort of thinking of uh, the Witch of Atlas, uh, which was written right after um, Shelley's uh, solitary trip to uh, the top of the uh, uh, Italian mountain uh, in the country. Uh, he said um, uh, that the sort of that the scene was trans uh, was uh, relocated in Egypt. But he said, um, uh, I just trying to remember in the poem that the witch of address find through the rude and worn disguise of uh, people, uh, the uh, the inner form which uh, the inner form most bright and fair, uh, this sort out outward a sort of that deform 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 uh, deform. Mention is just a disguise. Uh, through that sort of that a disguise, he could find the inner soul, which is which is quite sort of that a beautiful. And all the human beings are beautiful by nature, but it's custom and other sort of that the political uh, institution which deform people. And Shelley couldn't find any place in the world, I mean, real world, which he found that sort of that the utopian place wherever he was. Uh, in reality, as well as in imagination, he couldn't find. And in the past, as well as in the future, in the, uh, in the future, because that the, in Prometheus Unbound, the far goal of time, which is a utopia for, uh, for Shelley, uh, it's only marble figures, no human beings who created there. And so uh, he, he tried again and again, always in vain, but still trying to find a place where uh, humans can be uh, in, in harmony with, I mean, that the, the green earth, that kind of thing. But so that he travels, but he couldn't find it. That's what I'm sort of thinking. That's really interesting about thinking about what people's expectations were of travel books, um, which is something I need to learn a lot more about. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> thanks, Nahego and Ben and Kian. Yeah, no, thank you all. This has been a fascinating discussion and has broadened 
so far beyond just travel as a concept, but meeting people along the way and the way that landscapes are reshaped and texts are in conversation with each other and reshaping our perception of travels and of the landscape. This has been a, a brilliant discussion. Thank you all so much for these presentations and, and these questions and responses. I'm afraid that we're out of time now, surprisingly. I know we could keep going on. Um, oh, I have just seen one question from Nora Crook in the chat, though, and we cannot end without addressing Nora's question. Uh, Nora, would you like to come on screen and ask this, or would you like me to read it out for you? We'd love to see you, of course. We always love to see Nora. Hey. <laughs> Oh, you're just muted. Yes, right. You read it. You read it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yes, lovely. Wonderful papers. Thank you so much. A real treat in all sorts of ways. It's brilliant. Thank you, Nora. It's more, it was more an observation than a question, really. Just a reflection. Um, so Nora's reflection is, Nahoko, isn't it strangely appropriate that this much-traveled manuscript that is a much-traveled scholar post, fan suite, should be about the aspirations of the Jews, a people who have been figured as wanderers over the face of the earth to go back to their ancestral homes and that this was written by someone who was himself a traveler. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that's a great- As I said, it's just a thought. <laughs> And just as, as you were talking, it just really made me think that it's the, it all sort of hangs together, doesn't it? This, yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful observation, I think. And I'm certainly taking away so much from this round table. So yeah. thank, thank you to all of our speakers, to everyone who's joined in. And um, do take care. And our next event, um, we will, it's available on our website. If you go to the Shelley 200 section of our website, you can book onto our next event, which will be a roundtable on Percy Shelley for our times. Take care. And thank you, Amanda, for superb chairing with uh, um, really interesting reflective comments, bringing it all together as always. So thank you, thank you to Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.